We're going to be in the Gospel of Mark today. Grab your copies of God's Word. We're going to be in the Gospel of Mark. Uh, if you don't have a Bible, you can grab one in the seat back in front of you. It's page 487. And we're going to be in chapter 1, chapter 10, chapter 11, and chapter uh, 15. And so you'll, you'll need to keep your finger in all those places. We are uh, in our series, Every Book for All of Life, where we take one book of the Bible a week and we kind of give us a context for it, what it means, and, and how we can kind of work into it our lives or work our lives uh, in accordance with the Word of God. So uh, we're going to be in the Gospel of Mark. Will you pray with me? Pray with me as we uh, ask the Lord to do work through his word. God, we are grateful uh, that you have spoken into existence your word, that you didn't stay hidden, that we don't have to pretend uh, and grope around, lost, but that you have redeemed us, you've given us your word, that we might know you, we might pursue you. God, help us to treasure this, that we would not settle for lesser forms of wisdom, lesser forms of revelation, lesser forms of human instruction, God, that we would treasure your word for what it is. God, that it shows us about who you are, your character, shows us about who we are and what we need, and shows us about redemption. So God, as we look at uh, the gospel of Mark, as we look at who your son is, we would ask the Holy Spirit to work mightily today to show us who Jesus is, that we might leave here with a better sense of who he is, better conviction for what he provides, that we might might be changed by encountering Jesus today. And God, I pray that there would be, I pray that there are people here who don't yet know they're going to come to believe in your son today. God, I pray that there would be people today who, who are doubting doubting your forgiveness, doubting uh, in, their, in their sorrow, wondering if it can be forgiven. God, I pray that today you would show yourself through your gospel to be true and abundantly merciful. In your name we pray. Amen. I'm going to read uh, four quotes today. I want to start with uh, Richard Dawkins. With Richard Dawkins, noted atheist, he says this about Jesus. Jesus was a great moral teacher, but somebody as intelligent as Jesus would have been an atheist if he had known what we had known today. If Jesus had been born with all the science, what Richard Dawkins is saying is he'd be an atheist. Deepak Chopra, Chopra, spiritualist, Eastern spiritualist said this, Jesus intended to save the world by showing others the path to God Consciousness. Bill Maher, comedian and a guy with a talk show, said this, Jesus is a guy who's been used to justify everything, but at the end of the day, he's just another man. And finally, football great Tom Brady said this when when spoken to about Jesus, said this, I don't know what I believe. I think there's a belief system but I don't think Jesus is the only way in that system. Last week, we asked the question, who is Jesus? And these gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, answer the question, who is Jesus? Matthew, last week, uh, was answering the question this way, that Jesus is the promised Messiah, the long-promised Messiah, awaited king of Israel. That Jesus is not just some uh, some random guy who shows up, but that he is the culmination of all of the Old Testament prophecy, God's revelation, the king of the kingdom of God. Today, we're going to see how Mark answers the question, who is Jesus? And so I want to give a little bit of background on the book of Mark. I want to dive into an important theological concept, and we'll, uh, we'll kind of tease out this idea And then I want to look at four ways in the Gospel of Mark that people respond to Jesus, and then I want to invite us to respond to Jesus like a Roman would respond to Jesus today. So, uh, background of the book of Mark. Uh, It is Mark, the author. This is written around 60 to 65 AD. We know that uh, from church history and all that we can gather that Mark was a disciple of Peter. Uh, And around 60 to 65 AD, Peter is close to being uh, martyred for his faith. 
And uh, as church history says, Mark spent a lot of time with Peter, compiled the stories, and wrote the Gospel of Mark. The Gospel of Mark is the earliest gospel. It's the first one, shortly followed by, uh, by Matthew. And so this book, written likely in Rome, is written primarily to a Roman audience. There's not a lot of care for Jewish history in the book. In fact, uh, it's, it's very Roman in the way it describes and the language it uses and how it explains customs. And so it, it is very inhabited, aimed at Roman readers primarily. The structure of the book is roughly this in, in, three, in three phases. Uh, you would say the first phase is, who is this Jesus? The second phase is, who is this Jesus? But this time it's just the disciples for four chapters or three chapters. And then at the end, Jesus is the son of man. Now, the structure of Mark really is kind of this, this uh, the story of Jesus and people responding to him, culminating in chapter 15 uh, with the death of Jesus and an unlikely confession of faith. Uh, the book of Mark emphasizes the mission of Jesus. He uses the word uh, immediately about 35 or 34 different times. The action moves. It's really short and punchy. It is meant to display Jesus' one desire to get to the cross and to die and to rise from the dead. There's, no, there's like no wasted space in the book of Mark. It is just picture after picture of Jesus moving, healing, teaching, moving towards the cross. Why is the gospel of Mark so important? The book of Mark underscores how Jesus is the son of God who came to ransom captives and free slaves. At the core of Mark's uh, purpose for writing is to convince the people, mostly Roman readers, that Jesus is the son of God. Not just a God in the pantheon of Roman gods, but he is the son of God. He says Jesus Christ, which, which tips off to his Jewish readers, Christ just being the word for Messiah, that not only is he the son of God, but he is the long-awaited Messiah as well. Jesus, in the Gospel of Mark, calls himself the son of man, which is his favorite term uh, in, in the Gospels, in particular, Mark to describe himself. He says it, he says it about 14 times uh, of himself in the book of Mark. And this is, uh, this is if, you were to, if you were to take the Son of Man, if we were to just talk about this phrase just for a little bit, it's from a reference from Daniel, uh, the, the prophecy in Daniel. And let's go to the next slide. Great. Let me read it and we'll kind of follow along and so we can grasp what Jesus is saying about himself. From Daniel 7, 13 and 14, I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like the Son of Man. And he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him, and to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples and nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that shall not be destroyed. And so Jesus, he calls himself the son of man in all the gospels, in particular in the gospel of Mark about 14 times, a ton towards the end in chapters 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. And if you were to read the gospels and, and you might come away with the impression, Jesus calls himself the son of man. Why do we call him the son of God? He seems to understand himself as less because that title, why wouldn't you just call yourself the son of God? Well, by calling himself the son of man, he is calling himself the son of God. The son of man in Daniel has an eternal kingdom, conquers uh, all evil, rules over the earth. Certainly that's not just a normal man. And so when Jesus says I'm the son of man, he's referring to this passage in Daniel, which says, I am not just man, but I am the man who is also the son of God, which is why Christ, or which is why Mark at the very beginning of the gospels starts with this verse one, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the son of God. So why? Why is this so important? I want to get to this theological idea. It's important because at the very beginning of the gospel, Mark calls Jesus the Son of God. Jesus calls himself the Son of Man. These two things, these two things, these ideas are inhabited in one person. So all I mean to say is when we talk about Jesus, we mean that Jesus is fully God and fully man in one person. That is to say, when he's walking on water, he's not 90% God and 10% man. That he is, his, he is not, when he uh, is resisting temptation, he is not 90% uh, man and 10% God. That he exists 
fully God and fully man. The theological term for this is the hypostatic union. Say that with me, hypostatic union. Look, and I only say that because it's important to say theological words sometimes. So here we are, hypostatic union. And this is actually something that the, that the early Christians fought, died for, and had creeds over. This is how important it was. If Jesus is not fully man, he could provide, he couldn't provide full forgiveness for your sins. If Jesus was not fully God, he couldn't provide new life and resurrection. And so when we talk about Jesus, he is fully God, fully man, intertwined without either being mixed or confused in one person, the hypostatic union. And this is a feature of the gospel of Mark, that he is the son of God, he is the son of man, all in one, the hypostatic union. And all God's people said, okay, perfect. Fully God, fully man. Four responses to Jesus in the gospel of Mark. Four responses to Jesus in the gospel of Mark. What I want to do is I want to give you these four responses. I want to kind of tease out the story. And then I want to give you why, why I think it's important for us to kind of just notice these. Mark chapter 1. Open your copies of God's word. We're going to be in verses 28 or 21 to 28. And we're going to look at the first response of amazement. Verse 21. And they went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and was teaching. This is Jesus. And they, the crowd, were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one who had authority, not as one, as, not as one of the scribes. And immediately there was, in the presence of, of the crowd, a man with an unclean spirit. And he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent, come out of him. And the unclean spirit convulsed, convulsing him and crying out with a loud voice came out of him. And they were all amazed. So they questioned among themselves, what is this? Yeah, I would do that too, probably. A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits and they obey him. And at once his fame spread everywhere throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. And so Jesus begins his teaching, uh, basically saying, repent, the kingdom is near, goes into uh, goes into the synagogue and performs uh, this miracle, right? So he walks into a synagogue, and it was pretty normal for a teacher who went to a synagogue to be asked to teach. And so there is some understanding that Jesus walks in there, and he's already a noted teacher in the area, comes in his teaching, but he does some teaching that's different. He teaches as one with authority, Scripture says. And the scribes, everyone's amazed, because what would happen usually is someone would go and teach, and they would, they would grab a verse, and they would say, this rabbi says this, and this scribe says this. They don't teach with their own authority. They say, this is what it means based on the, the rabbinical history. Jesus gets up and teaches and says, you have heard it said, but it's this. Or he says, Isaiah says this, and here I tell you, it is, me, it is this. So he comes as one with his own authority, teaching the, teaching the word by his own authority and not with anyone else's. And the scribes and the Pharisees who run, who run the synagogue are amazed. The word there, astonished, astonished, it, it has this idea uh, that you've witnessed something that is extraordinary in human terms. Think like Simone Biles at the Olympics. Think, uh, think watching uh, a, a savant on the piano, just amazing, or vocalist with amazing range. You're, you're astonished. You, you look at it and you go, I can't believe I just got to witness this. It is so different, so extraordinary, that, it, that it, it brings you to just almost disbelief that something amazing like that could happen. And then the demon, uh, the demon shows up, and uh, which, which Mark is basically saying, listen, if he's authoritative here, the demon shows up in opposition. Jesus calls out this demon and casts him out, and the crowd is even more amazed. What is this? A new teaching with new authority. A new teaching, a new authority. This is a wild scene. It's a wild scene. Imagine going to synagogue, waiting to hear a great message. The new preacher gets up there and he preaches the most amazing sermon you've ever heard. And then a demon-possessed man comes up and not only following the sermon, they cast out the demon. Uh, the, uh, the, the preacher casts out the demon and you are astonished. And at the end of the service, you sing one more song and pick up your kids from the kids' ministry and drive away going, what just happened? 
That's what everyone feels in that moment. Something so extraordinary, something, they don't have a framework for it. How could you not be amazed and astonished in the presence of such a great communicator and such a great miracle worker? All throughout the gospels, we see Jesus doing this and people walking away, blown away at all that Jesus can do and all that Jesus can say. You know, it's, it's interesting, like most of us, like, man, if I could just hear Jesus preach, I'd believe, right? If I could just see Jesus cast out a demon, man, my faith would be so much stronger. Well, like the gospels show us, people loved watching him do great things, and they walked right away from him. The seeing wasn't believing in the gospels. They left amazed with what he could do, but no desire to believe in who he was. History is filled with people who think Jesus was a nice guy. This room is filled with people who are captivated by Jesus' teaching. But being amazed by Jesus' teaching and being amazed by his miracles just make us fans. They don't make us followers. That's one thing to say, he was a great teacher and a great miracle worker, but that doesn't mean I follow him. I'm amazed at what he can do. Albert Einstein said, I'm a Jew, but I'm enthralled by this luminous figure of the Nazarene. He's captivated, charmed, enthralled. He looks at Jesus and says, what a cool guy. He can do all these great things. We're reminded that amazement is not enough. Salvation is by faith, not by sight. That's why it's entirely possible for a group of well-meaning people to get together See Jesus cast a demon out and not fall and repent in the moment. Amazement isn't faith. Second response to Jesus in the gospel. First was amazement, this astonishment of, of what he could teach and, and how he could uh, uh, perform miracles. The second is confusion. Confusion. So we're going to go to Mark 10. Verses 35 to 45, Mark 10, 35 to 45. And so uh, Jesus has been spending time with his disciples. This is, about, uh, this is uh, towards the end of, of kind of his time with them and, and trying to teach them who he is and, and, and foretelling his resurrection and really spending time. He's moved away from teaching the many and now he's teaching just the few as the disciples. He's teaching about salvation. And what's clear? A couple things are really clear here. The disciples have some sense that Jesus is special some sense uh, that Jesus uh, is a miracle worker. He's a great teacher. They seem to ha have some sense that, that Jesus is significant for the people of Israel, but they're not totally sure why. They can't really put it together. He may be the Messiah of some sort, but it still is blurry at this point for the disciples. He may have authority for some way over Israel, but it, it, the disciples are confused, slow. Verse 35 of chapter 10. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came up to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your glory. Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking. Like, no kidding, right? It's great. Are you able to drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the bapti baptism with, I, with which I am baptized? And they said to him, we are able. And Jesus said to them, the cup that I drink, you will drink. And the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or my left is not for mine to grant, but it is for those who it has been prepared. And when the 10 heard it, the other disciples, they began to be indignant at James and John. And Jesus called them, and set, it called them to him and said, you know that those who are considered the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and their great ones exercise authority over them, but it shall not be among you. But who, who, whosoever would be great among you must be first your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even as the son of man, for even the son of man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. You know, Jesus, with his disciples, spent three years, three and a half years with them, teaching, preaching. You know how often he says to his disciples, do you still not understand? 
he, he was teaching parables in like chapter four, and they don't get it. And he goes, if you don't understand this, how will you understand anything I'm teaching? He looks at him, why are you still so afraid? Are you so dull? Don't you see? Now, it would be easy for us to go, man, like those disciples just didn't get it. They just weren't smart enough. And I think it might just be helpful to remind ourselves that we are the disciples. We, we, are, the, we are the confused ones. We are not the ones who, are, who have everything together. We're the ones, because we're the ones when money runs out, that we go, God doesn't love me and he can't provide. We're the ones that after God provides go, I did that, and forget all about God's provision. We're the ones who are tentative to faithful obedience to preach the gospel, whatever. They're like, we're the disciples. And so back to the story, though. James and John show up like a bunch of toddlers. And this is like, this is what it feels like to me as a, as a dad. You know, it's like a, a four-year-old coming, listen, I have a favor to ask, and the only answer you can give me is yes. Well, I tell you, I'm not even going to listen. I'm just going to say no. I'll, but no, absolutely not. Right? James and John want to sit at the right and left hand of Jesus. What, what, they, what they want, what they're anticipating is as Jesus goes to Jerusalem, that he sets up his kingdom and that James and John can sit in the right and the left. Let us, let us sit and rule in Jerusalem next to you. They were ready for Jesus' supposed political glory to bring them personal glory. And they said, listen, we've been with you a while. We're James and John. You know, we're your good friends. Put us at the right and left hand. No kidding the rest of the other disciples. Like, hold on a second. And I, I tend to think the only reason the disciples were indignant is because they didn't think to ask sooner. You know, like, they're just bummed that they, they, the other two guys got to it sooner. You guys? You can picture Peter. Hold on! Anyway, that's... And what does Jesus say? He goes, you don't even know what you're asking. Are you able to drink this cup? And the cup Jesus is referring to is the crucifixion. What he's saying is, listen, if you want this cup, it's going to be yours. And we know that James was beheaded in, in Acts, 6, Acts 12, and John uh, was boiled in oil and then exiled to work in the mines of the islands. Like, none of these guys had great ends. The disciples' confusion, though, was rooted in their wrong understanding of what their greatest need was. That if we misunderstand what our greatest need is, then we'll misunderstand who Jesus is. For the Israelites, if Jesus was just going to be a political, uh, uh, a political liberator or to right, right the ship uh, religiously, that once again we could be free uh, from Rome. And once again, we would be a, a kingdom of priests and Jesus is going to bring that about. He's going to throw off Rome and he's going to reestablish the right religious whatevers that, that, hey, we've got national needs and they require national solutions. We've got religious needs and they need religious solutions. And so James and John come asking, thinking, man, if this kingdom is going to be real soon, we should get in on this because it'd be great to rule over some people too. Confusion about who Jesus is arises when we think we have, or when we have the wrong view of what we need. I've gone through this before in some way. If our greatest need, that is, if we, if we think our greatest need is family harmony, then all we want from Jesus is for him to be a family therapist. And so we're happy when we get good advice and it works and our marriage is happy and our kids are happy. If our greatest need is political stability, then we will look and do anything for Jesus to be the greatest politician. If our greatest need is physical health, then, then the greatest thing Jesus can give us is, is healing. If our greatest need is f a personal fulfillment, then really what we want is, is Jesus to be a, a self-help guru. But here's the thing, like, if we misdiagnose our need, we will look to Jesus for something less than what he came to give us. And the real tragedy and danger is that you might end up getting less and be content with that. That if our greatest need is, is family harmony and we come to church and we get some good advice and, and our family begins to get stronger and our kids get stronger or, or we get some good marriage advice or some dating advice and we just feel good and, and we're content with that, the worst possible thing has just happened, that we've approached the Savior of the world and we've settled for less than salvation. We've settled for some version of just feeling better as we head to a Christless eternity. Jesus said, for the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom 
for many. What will this kingdom look like? How will it be formed? This kingdom will be upside down. The greatest will be the least. The least will be the greatest. How will it be formed? The king will actually die for the kingdom. He won't go and, and conquer through blood and, and military. That He will actually give his life in order to ransom those members who would be part of the kingdom. That in order to save those who are ransomed, uh, which is, or he'll ransom those who are in prison uh, or, or saved, that he will give his life in order to save and to bring liberation and freedom to those who are powerless, who are weak and needy. The kingdom will be filled with people who realize their greatest need is to be saved from their sin. That does not mean there are not other needs we have, but it means that if we come to the king of heaven and say, God, my greatest need is to, is to have fulfillment in my job, you will not find your greatest need fulfilled. All of humanity's greatest need is forgiveness and reconciliation with God. Too often people come to church hoping to get better advice on how to be more moral or a better person. And, and I, don't, I think scripture tells a lot about how to live. But if we misdiagnose who Jesus is and our true condition, we will encounter church as this moralistic place where people just hide their bad stuff and try really hard to be good and never encounter Jesus. Jesus came to save those who needed saving. If we get that wrong, Jesus' teaching, actions, and miracles will always cause confusion for us. Third response to, the, to Jesus in the Gospel of Mark, anger. Anger, we've got amazement, confusion, and anger. Mark 11, 15 through 19, as you're turning there, it's Holy Week in Jerusalem, which means it's, it's, it's what we call Holy Week is Easter. It's Passover week. And so Jerusalem's normally 60, 70,000 people during a feast week like this, the most important one, it's maybe 150,000 people. So it is packed with people. And in this week, uh, Jesus is more clear, more confrontational. He's more public about his, con his conflict with the Pharisees. Like, in, in fact, what, what happens in Holy Week is we see Jesus just uh, coming at the Pharisees at every possible turn, confronting them uh, and, and really confounding them publicly so much so that Jerusalem becomes this like beehive of opposition towards him so that it actually culminates in the death of Jesus. And this is the very first scene of him coming into Jerusalem that Mark records, Mark 11, 15 through 19. And they came to Jerusalem and he, Jesus, entered the temple and began to drive out those who sold and those who bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. And he would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. And he was teaching them, saying to them, is it not written, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. And the chief priests and the scribes heard it and they were seeking a way to destroy him for they feared him because all the crowd was astonished again at his teaching. And when evening came, they went out of the city. Jesus comes into the temple Monday morning, Tuesday morning, I think it's Monday morning, and in, in what is like the biggest, most religious week of the year, walks into the temple, the hub of all religious action. There's livestock everywhere, worshipers everywhere, tables everywhere. It is just a flurry of people. And he begins to flip over tables and preach and, and no one's allowed to carry. I mean, it is, it is a scene of a madman. We gotta ask ourselves the question, why does Jesus do this? Like, why does he quote Isaiah and he says, you know, my house should be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you've made it a den of robbers? Okay, so just briefly, Passover, largest, largest feast in the, in the Israelite uh, schedule, and you would usually travel pretty far to come to Passover in Israel, and usually you would need some sort of sacrifice as part of the worship, but you depending on how far you traveled, you wouldn't bring your ox or your pigeons or whatever. You would purchase it there at the temple, which was a really normal thing. 
that the temple would have, uh, part things you could purchase if you were a pilgrim and you couldn't bring your sacrifice, you could purchase it at the temple and then you could go worship the Lord. The Pharisees, they know about law, the law of supply and demand. They know about basic econo- economics. There's a high demand for these. We can make a lot more money than we usually would. And so we're going to extort all the pilgrims. And so instead of, instead, of, instead of doing what they normally did, which was to sell at a fair price so people could come and worship, they would drive up the price two or three times, basically exploiting people who were coming to worship the Lord. And so these people who were in charge of making sure people worship the Lord, the chief priests and the scribes who were in charge of this whole thing, begin to make money off those who want to worship the Lord. That the issue is not that the temple is selling something. That was relatively normal. The issue is that the temple leaders are implementing surge pricing and the animals Uh, on the animals and taking advantage of the worshipers. There's higher demand, you'll pay more. And and this is somewhat foreign to churches today because you're not charged to come in here and worship. And so this is, there's a disconnect here a little bit for us, but all we need to understand is that the leaders of of the temple had turned the Lord's house from a house of prayer into a house of mammon or money and defiled the whole temple. This is a relatively explosive entrance into Passover. Jesus is not playing around. This was violent and public, and the Pharisees and scribes were not happy. Verse 18, and when the chief priests and scribes heard it, they were seeking a way to debate him. No, destroy. They viewed him as a clear and present danger to their pride, to their status, and to their financial viability. That Jesus came in and took no prisoners. The scribes begin to feel their power threatened, their influence threatened, and their livelihoods threatened. And they begin to get angry because they've been publicly shamed. And, and, uh, and they do what most people do when they're publicly shamed. They react and lash out and begin to protect themselves. And, and look, they were fine with Jesus. They were fine with Jesus when he was just healing people and he was a fine distraction and he was up in Galilee and we could contain him. But he came to the heart of Jerusalem and he came to the heart of Jerusalem on the biggest festival and he came and he, and he upended all that we were about and it came at our authority and came at the temples. He has to die. And they set into motion. They set into motion his death. You know, like if we're honest, none of us like to be told we can't be in charge. None of us like to be told that we shouldn't live on the throne of our own lives. That our desires, that our, our passions often are not holy. And so Jesus comes into the, to the temple of our hearts and declares that we're in rebellion, declares that what we think is not best, declares uh, that, that unless something happens, we're headed towards a Christless eternity, declares that, that, that true life is not found in our own power and authority, but is giving it up. It makes sense why anger would be a primary response. Because at the core, what Jesus is saying is that to come and be part of the kingdom, you have to relinquish your throne, your authority, your power, your status, all of it. Because you can't do it. To the modern mind, sin, the concept of sin is an old religious construct meant to limit our best desires. It's a method of control that doesn't allow us to live our lives as we'd like. Or sin is something bad that we've done, but I can overcome it with good things, thoughts, and deeds. It makes sense that anger might be a part of a response to Jesus. That when confronted with a holy God who says that you can't be holy, you can't be perfect, and in fact, your sin has separated you from me and that you have no hope, and the only hope is Jesus, but first you must give up everything. Like, anger makes sense. Jesus will not share the throne of our hearts. Most of us get angry when our throne is taken from us. And most of us find peace when we finally give it up. Fourth response to Jesus in the gospel of Mark is belief. Belief. Mark 15, 
33 through 39, Mark 15, 33 through 39. So the, as you're turning, uh, we're kind of right at, right at the end of the culmination of, of all of this fervor and anger and betrayal and the, and the Pharisees and scribes and chief priests have, 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 have really gotten together and, 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 and begun this process. And Jesus has a conversation with Pilate and finds nothing wrong with him. Uh, but the Jews say, give us Barabbas. You, we, you keep Jesus, crucify him. And so Pilate lets the, the Jews crucify Jesus. And uh, six times in chapter chapter five, six times in chapter five, is he referred to as a king? Five times, king of the Jews, one time king of Israel. And it's important to note, to this point in the gospel, the only recognitions of who Jesus really is have come from God himself from heaven twice, one at the transfiguration, one at his, uh, one at his baptism, and then twice where demons confess who Jesus is. So far, no other person in the narrative has confessed Jesus Christ as Lord. It's been silent. Up, up until this point, up until this narrative, nothing, not the disciples. Verse 33. And when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lemma sabachthani. That word, sabachthani. That's close. Thank you. Which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders, bystanders hearing it said, behold, he is calling Elijah. And so someone ran a filled sponge with sour wine and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink. Wait and let us see whether Elijah will come and take him down. Verse 37, at last, or, and Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who was facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, truly, this man was the son of God. The first person in the gospel of Mark to confess Jesus Christ as the son of God is the one in charge of executing Jesus Christ, the son of God. The first person was not a disciple who had been with him, was not a chief priest or a Pharisee who finally came to it. The first person was a Roman centurion in the gospel of Mark who likely believed in all a little G gods, who was an outsider, not a Jew, had no claim to this. But, but for whatever reason, when he saw the way he breathed his last, said, truly, this was the son of God. And we don't, we don't quite know if it was all of the culmination of the moment. Maybe he was there when the Jews were saying, give us Barabbas. And maybe he was there next to Pilate when Pilate says, I find no wrong in this man. And maybe he was there as as, as Jesus is being nailed. Like, we just don't know. But whatever it was, it wasn't Jesus' teaching. It wasn't his miracles. It was how Jesus died in that moment that gave the centurion confidence to say, truly, this is the Son of God. Plenty of people were amazed and they walked away. Plenty of people were confused and they don't inquire further. So plenty of people were angry and opposed Jesus. But it was the man who killed Jesus who saw him for what he was. And this is the purpose of the whole book, to bring readers to this question. Who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? If to you, Jesus is a great orator and miracle worker, you'll never be a follower and just and experience the power. You'll stay a fan. If to you, he's confusing because you're wanting something else from him and you, you, you can't get this idea that your greatest need is sin, you will settle for less and never experience his power. If to you, he makes you angry because he demands every inch of your life. You'll never experience peace and forgiveness until you give it. Is Jesus the son of man who is fully God and fully man? Is Jesus the son of God who lived a perfect life and experienced the full weight of temptation without sinning? Is Jesus the son of God who died in our place that he might ransom us from prison? Who is Jesus? I wanna end with Mark 14, 51 and 52. It's an odd, it's admittedly maybe the most odd two verses in all of the book of Mark. And if you'll allow me, I'd love, to, I'd love to show you how they present the gospel to us. Verse 51, and a young man followed him. This is in the garden of Gethsemane where Jesus has just said, don't fall asleep, stay awake, be faithful. And this is, Jesus is about to be arrested. A young man followed him with nothing but a linen cloth about his body. So this is just a young man and he's got a toga or linen cloth on his body and they seized him. That is the people who came to seize Jesus grabbed him too. 
But he left the linen cloth, this boy left the linen cloth and ran away naked. And all God's people said, what? It's an odd inclusion. It appears in no other narrative. It's unique to the gospel of Mark. It's unique. If you'll allow me to do a little Greek work here. It's unique because he uses two words here that he only uses again in the Gospel of Mark in chapter 16. So here's what's happening. In all likelihood, this boy, this young boy, is Mark himself. Most people believe this is the Gospel writer 40 years later writing about himself when he ran from Jesus. He's recording one of his worst, most shameful moments, leaving Jesus, abandoning him, and not only doing that, but in a really shameful way. Maybe he's eight, nine, 10, or 11. He's not, like the old, he's not like the older disciples. You're writing this account with Peter. And in the chaos of the garden, Mark runs from Jesus because he's being taken prisoner. And in that chaos, he runs. Someone grabs his cloak and he sprints away in complete shame, naked. Okay, so where's the gospel here? Like, why is this, why are we harping on this point? The word for linen cloth here is only used here and then in chapter 15, verse 46. Why don't you turn to chapter 15, verse 46. It's only used here to describe Mark and then in verse 46 of chapter 15 to describe the burial cloth of Jesus. Same Greek word, Used twice, once for the clothing of Mark and once for the linen cloth of Jesus. It's not the same cloth, but he's using a literary device. Second term Mark uses is the term young man. Chapter 14 uses, uses that to describe himself a young man. Then the only other time it's used is in Mark 16, 5, where it describes a young man in the tomb. He's describing an angel, but he doesn't say angel. He says young man. And that young man is wearing what? A white robe. So Mark runs away in shame, leaves his, leaves his savior alone. He uses the same word for linen garment that then covers Jesus as he's buried. And then uses the same word to describe an angel that he uses to describe himself where he's now wearing clothed in white. Mark is writing this to display how Jesus took the very symbol of his shame, buried it, and in resurrection got glory. That all of us come to Jesus the same way, naked and ashamed in need of saving. And the beauty of the gospel of Mark is this shows Jesus who takes our shame, takes the worst of our linen cloths, puts it on himself, buries it, and all we get is his glory. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ, that all of us, with all of our brokenness, all of our faithlessness, all of our shameful running, all of our rebellion, all of the worst things, all of the worst acts we bring are buried with Jesus, and in resurrection, we get glory. And we tend to think, you know, I, Richard Sibbs wrote this of, of this tension to remind Christians there is more mercy in Jesus than there is sin in us. More mercy in Jesus than the, he can take all of our sin and he's taken it all in the grave. And in the resurrection, we get his glory. It was true for that young boy who ran from Jesus. It was true for the centurion who killed Jesus. And it's true today for anyone who believes. Who is Jesus? He is the son of life. He's the son of God who gave his life as ransom so that anyone who believed would have their sin taken into the grave and replaced by a robe of glory. Let's pray. Jesus, you are the son of God. You are the son of man. You lived a perfect life. You died on the cross for our sins, all of our shame, buried with you. Our dirty, our dirty rags, our filthy rags, all that we bring, all of our brokenness buried in the tomb. And you rose on the third day, replacing our robes of brokenness and dirt with shining, pure white. Forgiveness and reconciliation. You took our sin and gave us 
your glory. Lord, I pray today that there will be people who need to hear this, who look at their lives, whether it's 15 years ago or 15 minutes ago, and they say, God, I, I can't believe I've done that or said that. I, God, I know that there are some things. That, and they just look at who they are, and they feel such shame for what they've done. Jesus, would you remind them of that linen cloth that was buried on your body and that when rose from the dead, exchanged with pure, brilliant white. Would we all come to you and believe that you are the Son of God who takes away the sins of the world, who ransoms those in prison, who forgives sin and reconciles us to you, O oh God? Would you do that for us this morning? Amen.